Welcome to the Real View Podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of The Real View Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Wiley. With me today, we have no stranger to the podcast. She is an Ohio Realtors favorite, our Vice President of Legal Services here at Ohio Realtors, Peg Rittenauer. Peg, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Allison. Happy to be here. And we also have David Sippel. He is the owner inspector at Duke Inspection Services in the Cleveland area. He is a state licensed home expe- home inspector and radon tester. He's been in this business since 1999. He has conducted over 7,000 home inspections. That's a lot of homes. <laughs> so he has a ton of experience in this world. And they have joined me today because we are going to dive into the world of home inspections. There has been quite a few changes, and I know Peg and Lori joined us on a podcast to discuss this over the summer when these changes first were coming out. But it is time for a refresher now that it's been a few months since these changes have gone into effect and we're seeing kind of the world that exists with these new changes. So we thought it would be a great time to to revisit this. It's so important. It's such a hot topic right now, um, not only with the changes that have happened legally, but also with this multiple offer market that we are living in with low inventory and and this waving of home inspections, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But I wanted to welcome both of you guys to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Dave, thanks for joining. Welcome to the show. Well, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's going to be a great episode. Like I said, we have so much to talk about. So I want to go ahead and dive in. David, I want to start with you. I kind of mentioned some of your experience and background in this industry, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. How did you get started in in home inspection? What's made you want to start your own business? And um, what's been your experience in this industry in your career for such a long time now? Well, I got started because I was dissatisfied with a corporate job that I had. When I was in college, though, at uh, John Carroll University, I worked for a heating and cooling company, and I worked for a couple of years uh, doing all residential heating and cooling. And part of that job was also looking at the electrical system and going up into the attic and looking at the ventilation and looking at the electrical system on the outside and inside and outside. So that's where I really got to know how systems work around the house. And I really enjoyed going out to a different house every day or one or two houses every day. So anyway, I left a, a corporate structured sales job to uh, start my own business. I always wanted to have my own business. And at the time, there were not a whole lot of home inspectors out there. There certainly were not a lot of full-time professional home inspectors. So working with uh, ASHI, the American Society of Home Inspectors, I uh, began my training and you know, ended up getting certified by ASHI and passing their exams. And you know, at that point, there was a pretty easy way to start your business. There were not a lot of barriers to start a home inspection business. There certainly wasn't any licensing. I mean, I would tell people, hey, I started a whole new career. And they'd say, oh, did you get your license? And then I'd have to explain to them, there was no such thing as a a home inspector's license. I would joke even my dog had to have a license just to be a dog. (laughs) The dog had to have a license, right? And You know, it got to be where anybody with a ladder and a flashlight was out there calling themselves a home inspector. So over the years, there were many, many attempts to get a program started and get a program through the House, State House and the State Senate and all those good things. And so finally, it did come to fruition, you know, 18 or 19 years after I started my business. But I'm glad that we do have it now because we are professionals. We want to follow professional standards and we want to be recognized as licensed professionals. So I think it's a good thing. And just briefly, I know there was a lot of cooperation between the home inspection community, the local chapters of the American Society of Home Inspectors, ASHI. And then there's another group that a lot of inspectors belong to, which is referred to as InterNACHI. They work together with the real estate committees and the folks in Columbus. And so everything has its time and its purpose and it all worked out. And so we go forward under the licensing. Yeah. And um, so you can clearly hear that you are in favor and think this is a good thing. 
For those realtors, and I know you mentioned too, you do present quite a bit to different realtor offices and brokerages, and you present kind of on this new law. So for some of our realtors who may not be aware or have heard of it, but don't really know, you know, the details of it, um, could you tell us a little bit about what this new law is, what it encompasses and what it means to our industry? Sure. I really like going into offices or doing the Zoom meetings. I, I like to talk about home inspections. <laughs> I like to talk about what we do. And so I try to inform the real estate agents that, first of all, there is a licensing program that is coming to us from the same Ohio Division of Real Estate that they're working under. So, you know, there's a kinship, there's a professional relationship there that we're all in this together, hopefully with the client's best interest. But for example, we've had Zoom conferences where the superintendent Ann Pettit has come on and, and she's been very helpful to try to explain how these things were going to work. And so there is a professional relationship there. I explained to the agents that there's some things that are now required of home inspectors even before the home inspection would start. And a lot of the realtors are surprised to learn that, for example, we have a canon of ethics, we have a standard of practice, we have things that are part of the administrative code and the Ohio Revised Code that we have to do. Without getting into too much detail, one example of that would be what we call our pre-inspection agreement or our inspection contract. Think of this like a terms of service contract, like when you're on the internet, you want to get onto a new website or download an app and all this legal information pops up and you just click agree. Right. Well, we have a similar thing. And that document really is spelled out in the law that certain things have to be in that document. The customer has to be given the opportunity to read that document well prior to the home inspection. So in a concrete real world example, you know, let's say we had a home inspection appointment for this Saturday morning. You don't just show up and throw the document at the client and say, here, sign this required to give the client a chance to read this document. So I typically would email it to somebody as soon as they make the appointment. They are asked to read this document, which spells out that the inspector is going to be using the standards set forth by the state of Ohio. This is a little bit different. In the past, I might tell a client, hey, I'm following the ASHI standard. Or another inspector might say, I'm following the InterNACHI standards. Or some other inspector might not have a set of standards at all, right? They were just kind of downloaded some checklist off the internet. We are required to follow the Ohio standard of practice per the law, and so we spell that out to the client. The client has to sign that document to prove that they've read it and they authorize it prior to us starting the inspection. So the days are gone where we might get started on the outside, right? Like this afternoon, I have an appointment at 2 o'clock. The days are gone where I'm going to show up at 1.30 and get started on the outside and then hand this document to my client and say, hey, please read this. Why is that? Well, it's not fair to the client. The client doesn't have a chance to read that. It's, it's, it's not ethical just to throw a document at somebody once you've already got started, right? Also, we talk about the fact that ins inspectors have to be licensed, right? You can't do a home inspection if you don't have the license. And this goes for the teams, right? So mm -hmm. if you have a home inspection company and maybe the owner of the company, he's been around for 10 or 15 years but he's got full-time and or part-time inspectors on his staff that might only work on the weekends or something. All those inspectors have to be licensed, not just the gentleman or the woman that owns the home inspection company or owns that franchise. All the inspectors have to be licensed. There are some insurance requirements that many realtors are surprised to learn this. If I, if I could take a minute to yeah, talk about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The state requires us to carry liability insurance. So I always refer to that as hey, I'm in somebody's house. I'm not watching what I'm doing as carefully as I should. And I knock over a vase, right? And that vase happens to be, well, my grandmother gave me that vase on her deathbed and it's the most important. So now I need $50,000 to replace that priceless vase, right? So there's a certain amount of insurance that we are required to prove that we have. So yes, we do have proof of insurance. However, this is not errors and omissions insurance. The home, inspection, the home inspection law does not require the individual inspector or his or her company to carry E&O insurance. Now, all the home inspectors that I know, we're still carrying the E&O insurance. You'd be kind of crazy in this world not to have some type of protection for your own assets and your company and everything like that. But the theme of that is, and it's pretty clearly spelled out here, that 
we're not liable unless we're negligent or there's some gross negligence. There is a limitation of liability here. And that being in our industry and in the state of Ohio, pretty much if the customer is not satisfied with the job that you did and there's really no negligence that can be proven, you're liable to refund the fee. Okay, so it's a limitation of liability up to the fee paid. And so many home inspectors might say, well, I'm not going to carry E&O insurance, but I will carry the liability insurance. And that's an issue that sparks a lot of conversation with the real estate agents. So that's one of the reasons also why it's so important to get that pre-inspection agreement or the inspection contract to the client well in advance of your inspection. They can't come back to you and say, well, hey, I didn't know that there's some limitation. I, I wouldn't have hired you to do that. So anyway. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. Yeah, no, I love that. That's a great piece of knowledge right there that, as you mentioned, some realtors may be surprised to hear about. So I appreciate you um, sharing that. And I know one of the other things, too, that you kind of, that maybe we want to go over here today is the standards of practice and what is not required for a home inspection. Because I think this is important to mention, too, that maybe our realtors or our consumers interested in buying or selling a home may not be aware of. So tell us a little bit about that. No, that's a good question. We're not required to, first of all, do anything that would not be safe. Okay, so if the roof is wet and you deem that it's not safe to go up on the roof that day, you need to document that in your report. And then you're, you're fine. If there's a nasty crawl space or a weird attic access or you open up a crawl space underneath the first floor and it's all muddy and dirty and wet and you deem that it's not safe for you to enter that space, you're fully protected under this licensing law under the standards of practice, you just need to do a really good job of documenting why you didn't do something like that. Uh, We do inform our clients, of course, we're not moving furniture, we're not pulling out the refrigerator to look behind the refrigerator. But, you know, sometimes clients watch way too much HGTV. <laughs> See, that is what... Showing up with a- okay, so I am, like, so hooked on this HGTV, like, reality, home buying, like, selling sunsets, been a big hit on Netflix. So, like, I need to do an episode about what is shown on TV versus what is reality. I think that is so important. So I love that you right. brought that up, that there is that, you know, HGTV reality home buying mentality that some clients may have. Right. We're not tearing up carpet. We're, I do not carry a sledgehammer in my vehicle. <laughs> I'm not tearing open a wall to tell you what the condition of the pipe is in the wall. Now, uh, you know, there are certain things, however, that some home inspectors might choose to do. And so the law does not preclude, for example, if you want to offer a wood destroying insect report, that's not part of the general home inspection. But if you're licensed and you want to do a wood destroying insect report, the, the law doesn't stop you from doing that. You are not required by this law, for example, to test the visible gas pipes for any type of gas leaks. There's nothing in the law that says you need to show up with a, a little gas sniffer like a tester. But I mean, all the home inspectors I know use such a device. So you are allowed to exceed the standard where it's appropriate but you don't necessarily have to, and you could still say that you followed the standard. And so we try to explain that when we do these Tuesday morning meetings or the Zoom meetings. And again, getting back to what we started with, that's why it's so important to really let your client know well in advance that you're following a certain set of standards, and here's what we're going to do, and here's what we're not going to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, too, you mentioned um, when you speak to these offices that you leave time for Q and A at the end. And I am dying to know what is kind of the most popular question or a frequently asked question that you get a lot of times as you are doing these presentations. Far and away, agents like to share experiences 
why did the home inspector do this? Mm. Or why did the home inspector say that? So I'll wrap up the presentation and they'll say, thanks. Now I know a lot about the Ohio licensing program, but gosh, Dave, I was doing this home inspection last week and, you know, such and such home inspector, he did this and it really freaked my client out. And why did he do that? And oftentimes I have to say, well, he did that because he's required to check certain things or I might be wondering myself, why did he do that, <laughs> right? Yeah. So agents, rightly so, can be frustrated when home inspectors, in my opinion, exceed, kind of step over the line, maybe say something or do something they're not supposed to say or do. And so if they're following the standard, they're following the canon of ethics, then hopefully we're going to reduce those instances where I'll give you an example. I'm, I had a client call me the other day and they want to book me to do a, a follow-up inspection. They said that the inspector out loud said that this house that they were looking at was a ticking time bomb. Oh, wow. Why would a home inspector say that? I have no idea. But these are the things that come up. Inspector, uh, realtors love to tell us stories that are more negative than positive over things that either the inspector says or the inspector does. And so that's why it's a great, great thing that we finally have this licensing program because if you, to use an expression, if you stay in your lane and you do what you're there to do, we're going to reduce these cases where people walk away from a home inspection feeling very, very dissatisfied. Yeah. And maybe Peg could expound on that a little bit with inspectors getting themselves in trouble, saying things they're not supposed to say, but. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, you know, a perfect transition into PEG. I know you kind of had a few updates that you wanted to share since this law came out, some tools that are available from Ohio Realtors to all of our realtors. PEG, why don't you kind of take over? Yeah. Well, thanks, David. You definitely have a lot of knowledge. And um, I think you probably represent the the average you know, not the average, but, you know, the, the typical inspector that's professional that follows previously the ASHI standards or the, the other standards from their trade associations. And now, of course, most of those have been incorporated into Ohio law and are, and are following those. And, and I think there's a lot of great inspectors out there. And I think our members have developed great relationships with those inspectors. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, it was a joint effort by our association after many, many years of pushing to get licensure for inspectors in the state of Ohio to be able to join forces with your industry to accomplish that. And um, I think it's going to be a good thing for your industry, number one, and but most importantly for the consumer, which is, I think, you know, the end goal for realtors and the home inspectors is to make sure that the, the buyers are, are getting a good, competent evaluation of the property that they are looking to buy so that they know what they're getting into. So, yeah, Allison, I wanted to mention a couple things. You know, as David mentioned, you know, we, we now have to use licensed home inspectors in the state of Ohio. That went into effect on July 1. And so I think most of our local boards have included language in their purchase contract, in their inspection clause, clarifying that. Now, there's some exceptions to that, but we're not going to go into that today. We've got a lot of resources on our website where we've discussed those exceptions. But, you know, one of the things that's important to realize is that the home inspectors are licensed individually. I'm glad that David brought that up, not just the companies, because that is important to understand. And that question come, or that issue can come up with respect to the issue of recommending home inspectors. And for years, most real estate licensees thought that they were required by law to give the name of at least three home inspectors if they were going to provide any names. And that really wasn't the law. It was just a good business practice. And the reason for that was because there was this, there's this, what's called a cause of action, uh, an ability to sue somebody for a negligent referral. So if I gave you the name of somebody, whether it's a home inspector or somebody else, and I had no basis for providing that name, I, I didn't know them, I didn't know if they were credentialed, I didn't know anything about them, I just threw a name out there, and I did that in a negligent manner, I could potentially be held liable if that person did a poor job that resulted in damages. And so we did have a couple cases against real estate licensees for making negligent referrals for home inspectors. So they began this practice of giving the three names, but that has now been basically incorporated into the home inspector licensing laws and into the, the Ohio brokerage licensing laws. And it, the first thing that's important to realize is it doesn't require you to give any names, but if you give a name, you have to give at least three. 
Mm -hmm. And they have to be licensed by the Ohio Division of Real Estate, as David mentioned. And one of the questions, and this is kind of coming back around to what David said, is people will say, well, can we just give the name of three home inspection companies? And the answer to that is no. You have to give the names of three licensed home inspectors, a minimum. You could give more, but if you're going to give any names, you have to give at least three, and they have to be individuals that are licensed. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you want to give three names all at the same company. You could maybe, you could do that, or you could list XYZ home inspector company, and here's the individual names, and then, you know, put another something, you know, other names but you can't just put down a company name. So one of the resources that you mentioned that we just put out there for our members was kind of a a sample form for providing those names. You might think, well, why do we need a form? But it's really a good thing for the brokerage because in my view, it really should be the brokerage that's creating the list of names that you're providing. And and we try to avoid calling it recommendations. Uh, There's protections in the law from that type of negligent referral type of litigation And so really you want to get your agents away from saying, hey, I recommend these three guys to I'm providing you these three names. Here's also a place where you can go on the division's website and find the list of home inspectors. So you can check any uh, if you want to go off this list and you know look at somebody else, make sure they're licensed by the state of Ohio. It confirms to them that they do have to use somebody licensed by the state of Ohio. And it basically contains some language saying, you know, this isn't an endorsement. This isn't a recommendation. We're not warranting their work. But, you know, here are some names of people that are licensed in the area there. So so that form's available on our website, which I hope all of you, all of you know is ohiorealtors.org. And then you just go to the legal tab. And when you go there, you can go to forms, the area of forms, and um, just go down and you'll see some something under the heading of home inspectors. And you'll find that that form. Yep. Great, great resource there. Definitely check it out if you haven't already. And I know another kind of hot topic that before we even started recording, we were discussing a little bit and David, you know, had some questions around this. So I think this is going to be interesting to hear for both our realtor members, as well as uh, many home inspectors that are listening, is the idea that the realtor uh, needs to accompany the the inspector on um, a home inspection unless it's agreed upon. Peg, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I think it was back in, boy, 2018 or 19, the Ohio Real Estate Commission and the superintendent sent a letter to all the brokers in the state of Ohio basically saying, you know, we have been seeing a lot of violations by realtors who are allowing people access to a property without a realtor being present. Some cases, those might have been letting a buyer in, giving a buyer a lockbox code, but in other cases, it was other individuals. So they came out with this position that... No one could enter a property that didn't have a real estate license unless they were accompanied by a real estate licensee. And then the only exception to that would be if the seller had provided what they called written informed consent. So what that meant was that licensed home inspectors, appraisers, maybe a contractor, somebody coming in to check the pool, anybody like that, you know, check the fire, the the chimney, when they scheduled that appointment, You know, unless they had the written consent of the seller for them coming into the property by themselves, that the realtor had to be there. And so, you know, that caused a lot of a lot of changes. And we know we have lock boxes in many areas. And so one of the concerns is about giving out lock box lock box access, excuse me. And how do you let these people in? So, you know, even if the seller said, yeah, I'm fine with the inspector going in or I'm fine with the contractor going in. Is it okay for a realtor to give out lockbox code or key? And the answer to that really depends. And it depends on who owns the lockbox. If it's the realtor's own lockbox that they own themselves, it's not part of an MLS lockbox system, and the seller has given consent to their agent giving out the lockbox combination for the inspector to come in alone, then that's fine. But if it is an MLS lockbox system, then you have to look at, does that home inspector, and we're going to focus on the home inspectors because that's what we're talking about today. Under some lo- under some local boards and MLSs, inspectors can be, I think they're called an affiliated youth member or something, and they can obtain lockbox privileges. So if in that case, they have their own codes and things to get in. So if, if again, the seller has consented to them going in and the inspector has lockbox privileges via the MLS, then that's fine. But if the inspector does not have lockbox privileges through the MLS, then the age, the, the lockbox rules of the MLS are very clear that they cannot give their code to someone. 
They can't give it to a buyer. They can't give it to the inspector to go ahead and get started early before they you know, are able to get there. They have to wait for the for the realtor to come. Yeah, I think that's great. If I could jump in there, I would tell you that all the home inspectors I know, we want that those rules to be in place. We don't want the liability of somebody saying, well, you, you were in that house alone and, and now something's broken or, you know, you were in the house alone and now my watch is missing or something like that. We, when I say we, I mean all the home inspectors I know, we welcome the real estate agent to be at the inspection. We want that secondary set of eyes and ears to see what's going on. It helps us reduce the time it takes with questions that might pop up if the agent can't be there. You know, the agents as well as the inspectors don't want to take 15 minutes on the phone at 10 o'clock at night to go over something, right? So we think it's good that we have these rules. I remember that letter being sent out and I keep a copy of that letter because every once in a while an agent will say, well, hey, here's the lockbox. And I'll say, do I have permission to use this? And then it comes back, yes, you do have permission. And I'll say, well, text that to me. Or can you email me that, right? I want to cover myself and my liability. It also, we have similar things where once the inspection is taking place, we need to document in our reports who was at the inspection, right? So you're going to say, Bill Johnson, real estate agent, you put that in your report. He was present during the inspection. And we need to get permission, and I get it in writing, that I have permission to send the report to Bill Johnson, the real estate agent. So, of course, the client can send the report to whomever they want to. Once they pay for it, it's their report, right? And I don't know if time allows for us to get into certain issues with inspection reports bouncing around out there in the uh, in the internet world, right? Out, out there in the ether. But my client pays for the report. My client instructs me to send the report to the real estate agent. I'm happy to do so. If I don't have that specific permission, I'd never feel comfortable sending the report. So we, we want to get that in writing. And that can be an email or that can be a form, could be on the pre-inspection agreement that you're giving agents access. I know that we also, when we're writing the report, are going to include language that this report is prepared for the sole exclusive use of the client. It's the client's report. And so that comes up sometimes where you might get a phone call from somebody saying, hey, I've got a copy of a report here you did about a month ago, and I just have a few questions about it. Maybe it's a secondary buyer, right? Maybe the first buyer, my client decided not to buy that house. I always say, I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to discuss this with you because you're not my client. So let me call my client. And if I get permission, I'll call you back. So that's part of the home inspector licensing that we want to document who's at the inspection. And we need to get documentation from our client that it's okay to send these reports out to their real estate agent. Yeah. Yeah. Great mentioning there. And I know with just a couple minutes left. Oh, I ha- yeah, go ahead, Peg. Yeah. I, I just wanted to mention one thing about um, this whole issue about, you know, ins- inspectors being able to go in without the realtor. Because we, we've had a couple calls about this, Allison, and that is many people have said, well, now that ho- home inspectors are licensed, do we still have to go with them? And the answer to that is yes. We, we did broach this subject with the superintendent of real estate. And she did discuss it with the Real Estate Commission, and they confirmed that even though home inspectors are licensed now, you know, and appraisers are, et cetera, that that doesn't change the fact that in the eyes of the Division of Real Estate, they want the seller to provide consent to have people in there um, without the real estate licensee present. So that that hasn't changed at all. So I wanted to make sure that there wasn't any um, confusion about that. So I'm sorry. No, no, that's okay. No, great, great point of clarification there. And um, good for our realtors to know. Absolutely. So I know with just a couple minutes left, this, I, I'm sure we could do a whole episode on this and maybe we can revisit. But um, just in a few minutes, let us know why it is a bad idea to waive home inspections in this market. We know that is something that's coming up more and more uh, with inventory being so short and off multiple offers being such a thing now. But why should you never waive a home inspection? Well, from the buyer's standpoint, the reason you don't want to waive a home inspection is because when you do that, you know, you're really just buying the property without having full knowledge of the condition of the property. And, you know, you're going to go through with this transaction. And I imagine most buyers put most of their resources into their down payment. 
And, you know, they don't want any surprises after they purchase the property to find out that they're going to have some issue, um, that there's going to be some maintenance issue, that there's going to be some repair or replacement issue that they weren't anticipating that could be very costly. Um, you know, unfortunately, sometimes buyers will look at the residential property disclosure form and they'll think, well, you know, the seller said, didn't say they had any problem with these things. Well, maybe the seller hasn't because it hasn't manifested itself yet, right? Problems are going on that you can't see as a seller and you're not seeing evidence evidence of it yet, or they just may not be aware of an issue. So it, it's really important. And the biggest risk that a buyer runs is that they're going to have very costly and maybe, you know, disruptive repairs and, and work that are going to have to be done to their house that they didn't expect. And so, you know, I know a lot of buyers are, are using that as a strategy to you know, kind of make their offer more attractive, but I think it's really short-sighted because you do want to know what you're getting into with respect to the maintenance care of the biggest investment you're making in your life. And David, I'll let you jump in there. I'm, I'm sure you're going to, obviously you're in the industry, but you probably see what happens when people don't have inspections done before they buy a property because they call you later to come in and look at something. <laughs> They sure do. And they call up and complain. And it can be very frustrating that for whatever reason, they chose not to get a home inspection. But I always try to attack it with two ways of thinking. Number one, I understand you're buying the house as is. I understand there's so little inventory in some of these neighborhoods that you perhaps even paid a little bit more than you wanted to pay. I understand that it's an as is transaction. The seller is telling everybody up front, we're not making any repairs, but don't you want to know what as is, is like you have the right to inspect the property. And even if we're only going to point out major defects that would make you think about walking away, you don't want to waive that right. Okay. So the, the seller is not going to fix the one little broken window in the dining room, right? Okay, we understand that. Maybe five years ago, you could present a honeydew list to the seller and say, I want you to fix all these things. But you do want to know what as is really is. And then second of all, I see a trend, and maybe you guys would agree or disagree. A lot of the people waiving their home inspections are first-time home buyers. In the entry, this is their first house, right? They're entering into the beautiful world of home ownership. And so it's the job of a qualified home inspector also to teach and inform and show people how things work and and show them where the water valve is and show them where the gas valve is and show them how to replace the filter on their furnace and show them that they need more insulation in the attic. You're not going to turn around and tell them that the seller is going to do this for you. No, these are things you're going to need to do after you move in. And so for, you know, $400 or whatever the standard fee would be, it's a tremendous educational opportunity for the first time home buyer. And to ever let a first time home buyer waive the right to an inspection is mind boggling to me. But I do understand under certain market conditions, I do understand why it's happening. But again, you want to know what as is really means. So never waive the inspection. Just tell them we're, we just want to get an, a knowledge of what we're buying. And then also hire a qualified inspector who's going to teach. Let the people follow you around. Let them ask questions. Be involved. Engage your client and teach them about the house. And they're going to look at you as their advocate. You're the consumer advocate. And it's a great experience for $400. They are going to love their house more in most cases because now you've taught them how it works. And you can point out the positive things too. Hey, look, we have new windows in this house. We have a high efficiency furnace. It's not your job to sell them on the house but you're informing them of the good things, not just the defects. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. We have to wrap it up there. I know we got we went a little long today, but I appreciate you guys uh, tuning in for all this wealth of knowledge. David Pegg, thank you guys so much for joining me. To our listeners, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks, Allison. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Thank we'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time.